Hi everyone, welcome back to the Self-Sufficient Homestead with Tanya Milan and today I'm here with a very special guest. Uh, we're doing a trailblazer interview with Craig Johnson from My Sustainability Journey and Tamakoa Homestead. Now if you ever wanted to start this whole dream and process of going from city life all the way to staying on a homestead or a farm and being self-sufficient and self-sustainable, then this is the guy to follow. So my self-sustainability journey uh, is where he started off with his dream and he did all his urban videos. You've got There's a lot of information there, a lot of instruction, a lot of knowledge, things that you can look at. And then now Tamakoa Homestead is where they are moving to the mountains and they are busy setting up their beautiful homestead in the mountains. So let's hear more about Craig and the dream and why and everything that's happening. Craig, welcome to Trailblazers. Thanks, Tanya. It's absolutely amazing to firstly get to meet you in person because we've spoken so much. And for those of you watching that don't know, she's got the most incredible Facebook page. It is so active with so many different people sharing, asking questions, and I've learned so much. So it's been such such an honor to get to meet you finally. And yeah, I think it's going to be a great conversation. I would say likewise, because I've been looking forward to meeting you too, so it's really great. All right, so Craig, tell me, what is the dream? The dream is, um, I suppose, making a dream the reality, which is, I think, the biggest step which a lot of people struggle with is, doesn't matter what your dream is, the most important thing is to live out your dream and not become... A retired person who's still looking back on the dreams that they had and mm. have regrets. Um, so my biggest dream is to live out my dream. And for me, my dream is to just be completely self-sufficient from greens to fruit, veg, meat, and then ultimately getting off grids, uh, become reliant on Mother Nature and all of her abundance because it's insane how much abundance there is in nature and we've just become so disconnected from it um, and then probably the most important part of all of that is is my children and family and getting them to grow up in an environment where they appreciate everything they know where their food comes from they know how it's made they know how it grew up um, just to show a bit more appreciation for what they put into their bodies um, and then just ultimately living a way less stressful life because the lives we live, paycheck to paycheck, stress to stress, is so, so hard on us, so hard on relationships, so hard on families, um, and it's it's like the whole gardening technique back to Eden, going back to Eden and living slow, living purposeful, and just having a lot of meaningful interactions with family, children fellow community members so that's that's the dream awesome well tell me quickly where are you now though i mean you can tell us you can rewind a bit and tell us where it all started but i want to know what do you do what do you do for a living because this whole thing of we want to be self-sufficient self-sustainable and there's like a big debate in my heart because uh, self-sufficiency versus Holy Spirit efficiency and you actually said it different now reliant on mother nature so you're not actually self-sufficient you're reliant but yeah. on mother nature which is I mean that's just a, a play of words and it really has so much meaning um, but where, where did it all start um, and where are you now what do you do etc hmm. so it all started with very much trying to eat cleaner um, I, by trade, I'm in digital. I'm a digital marketing strategist. So my brain works big picture by default. So the way I think, everything I do is big picture. So I don't actually look at details. I just say like, what is the big picture? What is the impact? So for me, everything we eat is, is out of control, to be honest. Uh, most of the foods that we eat, it, it cannot, in my opinion, even be classified as food. 
<laughs> because of what it's actually made up of. And that is what many, many years ago, what got me into growing food. Now, the challenge was that we were in an urban area, had a limited amount of space. And I think this is where a lot of people get stuck, where they think you need hectares, acres, mm. you need animals, all of these things, where in fact you actually don't. Um, you can grow three to four kilos of potatoes in a 30 by 30 centimeter on a tile, which means if you have 10 tiles, you can grow a huge amount of food, but people just don't know that. And that is what my sustainability journey is, was ultimately about and still is, is how do we take urban living, smaller spaces, and create some kind of way to supplement our food with something that's nourishing. And one of the things I always say, which I know we've spoken about as well, is don't try and become self-sufficient. Try and become self-sufficient in something. Yes. So if you are in an urban space and you're in an apartment and you have a balcony and you love salads, salad greens are incredibly expensive. They're also incredibly easy to grow. So become self-sufficient in salad greens. Yes. You can grow a beetroot and you don't need much space for that. But you can then, while the bulb is forming, eat the leaves in the salad. They are highly nutritious so you don't need to just have lettuce so quite often what I would do is have multi-purpose crops in small spaces exactly like the beetroot which will give you a bulb and the leaves um, radishes the same kale um, so you can end up having a greens salad that is not made up of lettuce but of nutrient dense greens that is going to give you a second crop within a small amount of space and even in in an the balcony of an apartment you can grow all the herbs you need you don't need to have dried herbs from the shops you just use them fresh the flavors are way more intense um, rosemary thyme marjoram all of those things you can grow in very small amount of space so I think a lot of people need to take a step back and not immediately go into the self-sufficient dream but rather say, what can I become self-sufficient in, master that skill, then move on to the next thing. Yeah, that's a very that's a very practical way of aligning your mind to doing step by step. I mean, self-sufficiency is about step by step. So hmm. um, otherwise you will get overwhelmed. So I like your approach, Craig, because it's just like what you have, do with what you have and just optimize what you have into being self-sufficient from it. So I really like that concept. Yeah. If you look at if you look at self-sufficiency as a whole, there's I mean, there's a lifetime's worth of skills you need to learn. Yeah. Which the reality is we don't have multiple lifetimes to learn these things. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to we need to live out the saying of to become a jack of all trades but a master of none because Self-sufficiency isn't about becoming a master of everything. Yes. It is knowing how to do everything to a point that it works. Yes. So can you make bread? It's great. Start out with bread, but you need to buy yeast. But don't immediately start making sourdough because you're going to get completely overwhelmed by the two days it takes to make sourdough, where it can take you an hour to make bread. Yes. <laughs> so do things like that and start off with the basics, then move your way up to things. But if we look at self-sufficiency, it's growing fruit. And growing fruit is pruning, it's pest control, it's fertilizing. Then you've got your vegetables, you've got your meat. And you, I don't have a lot of experience in meat growing, which you do. Then you've got not just caring for the animals, the whole butchering side, which is an entirely different skill, whether you do it yourself or not water storage building the the range of skills for self-sufficiency is energy is huge and, and I can tell you now someone who's living a city life working a city job who has this dream to become self-sufficient sells everything goes and does it we've seen so many times those people end up just going back to the city because it's just too, too much. overwhelming and in comparison, I've been just looking for property for five years. 
knowing that in these all this time I'm harnessing little skills learning to grow in pots learning to grow some things here having fruit trees learning techniques so when we get there like having chickens I've had chickens and we used to have more eggs than what we can can eat but then you're forced to eat with it and that's part of that self-sufficient journey is not deciding what am I going to have for supper but looking at what you have and saying what, what can I, I make? do <laughs> with what I have? Yeah. <laughs> and until you actually experience that, you can't live that. And I think a lot of people get a huge culture shock when they want to make the move and they experience it for the first time. They're just like, no ways, no ways. But bite sizes, yes. and then it becomes a logical progression, which, yeah, I think another topic that I really personally struggle with is anything to do any word or name that has an ist to it which is like a purist an extremist anything that has an ist behind it yes because that's not what we should be doing if we look at labels like permaculture back to eden no dig double dig all of these things these are all labels and as soon as you apply a label to yourself or to someone else, you end up creating a purist environment, which anything that deviates quite often gets kind of judgment or guilt or like, why am I doing things wrong? So having that open mind of, I'm going to take a little bit, I'm going to take principles two, three, and four from permaculture. I'm going to take the mulching method of back to Eden, and I really like what they do with regenerative agriculture. I'm going to combine all of those and make it my own. That's what I think we need to be doing, and not looking at all of this information out there on how to become self-sufficient, because they all have gaps, they all have their problems, and it's a big challenge for a lot of people, because you get stuck in a very specific mindset that it's hard to get out of, and then it's quite limiting in your journey. Yeah. I said a hell of a lot very quickly there. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me try and sum it up because um, what I hear Craig saying is we need to look what we have around us and what we have to our disposal, use it, optimize it, and start um, being self-sufficient in those ways, but also not comparing yourself to any system or anyone else because the moment you do that, you're in trouble. Um, I've spoken to you before in some of my videos about 1D humans and 1D systems. You just see the lovely, the great, the everything, but it is so unrealistic. So take the things you have, apply from different uh, systems or concepts, and what works for you. There's no line that says this is the only line that you have to walk on to get to your dream at the end of the day. Um, it's combining all these strategies and mm. um, skills, etc. And you are building these skills over time. So this way, if you look at it this way, it won't be overwhelming. And it won't, it won't get you down because it's a learning curve. And it's so cool to learn because you've got all these things coming in. Sometimes we make mistakes. But we learn from it. I mean, you've, your journey has been so exciting. And uh, it's been challenging as well. I mean, you've had an operation recently. It's kind of just, I mean, you were like, I'm going to go build my house. and I'm going to build the houses on Tamako Homestead so that people can come there. And it's been halted <laughs> because of things that happen in life. And if you let yourself be controlled about outside things, then you're never going to get there. So we need to be adaptable. We need to, to work on, at our pace and our ability and just and grow ourselves from there and you're doing a really great job mm, and you. what I do like about both my sustainability journey and Tamako Homestead is how much information and knowledge and skill you're putting out there to others and not just that the insight that you give the the mental uh, drive that you have there and that you share with others and helping us to um, to apply it in our own lives as well so mm. that's really great so what can we expect from Tamako Homestead coming up in future well, um, now that I've kind of had a couple of my plans put on hold, um, my two-season plan, uh, so I want to try and just work in the two seasons we have with nice weather of spring and summer, is to create a caged-in vegetable garden okay. and a caged-in fruit orchard. 
because we have the boons and anyone that's watching if you've ever experienced the boons you'll know that if, unless you cage something in yeah. with metal yes there, there's no way of keeping them um away and if you have fruit trees they climb into fruit trees they fight in the fruit trees so they break branches off um they take one bite of fruit and throw it next one one bite throw it um, so baboons for us are a huge problem, but therein lies a solution that you know, we're going to create big enclosed areas where we can use shade cloth to protect against the summer summer elements, but also the winter cold. Yeah. So I suppose this is one of the permaculture principles that the solution, or what is it? The problem is the solution. Okay. So if you look deep enough into the problem, it, you will find your solution. Absolutely. Um, so it's fruit orchard, vegetable garden, um, structures, not actually creating them because we're not there full time yet. And then building a tiny A-frame. So we at least have a base to be able to build our main house. Um, and then we have you can come and stay there, other people can come and stay there and experience what it's like on a building up, establishing homestead. Because I think a lot of a lot of what YouTube has done is romanticized. Yeah. You romanticized the concept of homesteading. Um, and also blurred the lines of what homesteading is. Um, and I think it's important, and that's why I decided to document everything from a bare piece of land that's just got fan walls and nothing else all the way through so people can see just how much work it is, mm -hmm. and what's required, dedication, hard work, and so they can decide whether it's for them or not. Absolutely. And on that point, there's a very interesting um, like bipolar space on YouTube at the moment when it comes to homesteading. There's the group that says, quit your job and start homesteading. <laughs> and there are so many videos. And if you look at that, those are all established homesteaders that have been doing it for many years. <laughs> or people that come from money. Yeah. It's one of those two. Yes. If you come from money and you have a lot of money, then yes, you can quit your job because you can set up the entire homestead, all the structures, all the animals in six months. Yeah. And if it's existing, you can just move in. Then there's the other side, which is don't quit your job and don't homestead. And it's very much the same principle of learn skills, dip your, dip your fingers into having chickens. Are, there, are you okay with the lice, the fleas, the poo, the eggs, the maintenance? If not, like, then it's a romanticized dream that might not be for you. And that is okay. But <clears throat> I think part of this whole YouTube journey as well is they're getting these bipolar options and we need to be in the middle. Yes. <laughs> we need to be like, this is the real world. You need your job because unless you come from money, yeah. you're going to need money. Yes. I mean, you do live self-sufficiently and you need money. Yeah. I, I must tell you, I've had the comment quite a few times and I had the comment from somebody that I saw on this road trip that I'm at on at the moment. Um, you must have loads of money. <laughs> and I'm like, no, <laughs> I also work. I have to work to be able to get to the point where I want to be. But my end goal is to get to a point where I do not have to work, where I can just be then completely I can live off the land and hmm. with mother nature, but I'm not there yet. And it's okay. It's not a shame. I'm still Absolutely working. <laughs> right. Another question that just came into my mind was, um, why do you think moving towards a self-sufficient dream is so necessary in today's world? That's a really good question. Um, and we'll see how people <laughs> take on their responses. Um, so why we need it is because we have completely lost touch with the modern natural world or just the natural world. Yes. And I can give you two examples of that, which is food. We call our food now food. Yes. But we call food that has not been chemically treated or altered in any way organic. 
<laughs> and that's the original food, actually. And that is the original one. So we got it completely mixed up. That the one that is completely synthesized, man-made, and contains a whole bunch of harmful things is what we're calling food. Yes. And then the natural things, not. Exactly the same with milk. We call highly processed, homogenized, pasteurized, non-nutrient dense milk, milk. We call raw milk something completely, we call it raw milk. Like you can't drink raw milk. But it should just be, that's, that's milk and then what is treated and worked on should be called something else. Yeah. And that's where we've lost complete touch with the natural world. Um, and people don't know where their food comes from. Um, they call animal cruelty when they see an animal being slaughtered or butchered or anything like that. But they will happily go in and buy two kilograms of steak, <laughs> lamb. They they see baby lambs in the field and be like, how dare you touch that lamb? But that afternoon they'll go buy a fry pack of lamb and pop on the fire. Um, and, and that's why it's so important for us to get back to that so that we can start realizing where our food's coming from and where we are moving towards in terms of lab-grown meats, genetically modified foods and like going back to the IST, I yeah. don't label myself IST anything because I don't have a problem with GMOs under certain conditions that I completely understand that in certain conditions and countries, they need to be able to grow something like maize, but they cannot because of the climate. And there we can use modern technology to alter it slightly to be able to handle heat, mm. to be able to have a different rootstock that can handle a lot more moisture, as an example. Um, but there's a very fine line in open pollinating, crossbreeding, and completely genetically altering the, the makeup, nutrient density, and that of food. And we're caught in this, this space at the moment where I don't think people know what food is anymore. Yeah. And when they taste real food, they don't like it because they don't know what real food tastes like. Like having, having a bite of beetroot is not great. <laughs> but you buy like a, a thing that's been a whole bunch of stabilizers, sweeteners, colorants, modifiers, all of these things, and it's like, oh, beetroot tastes nice. Mm. But just eating a bite of beetroot like an apple is going to be, depending on the variety, not anything like that. You've got to go through the process of learning. How do you preserve it, can it, all of that. So there's a lot that we've lost touch with that we need to get back bread 18 ingredients in bread and there's three ingredients in bread if you make it yourself yeah. we don't need all that let's just get two more practical things quickly we've spoken about a lot of good insightful things but back to um, smaller things you know we often see on Instagram Facebook all these places we see these huge successes I mean these major big vegetables or beautiful gardens and harvests and not a weed in sight and uh, huge pumpkins and and um, is that really the reality is that really the reality no no <laughs> if anything I've seen pictures of these guys that the cabbages are bigger than them but I can promise you that person picked out the biggest and healthiest looking cabbage for the photo and I, I generally have a rule of thumb just for my own feeds that if I don't see someone showing some kind of failure, then I don't follow them. Okay. Because this journey is by far a successful one. It's, I mean, you know yourself, it's probably tainted by more failures than there are successes. Um, most certainly in the beginning, you're going to make a huge amount of mistakes. Your cabbages are going to get decimated by absolutely everything until you figured out how. Yes. And it's it's important that people should be open to sharing that. Yeah. And that's what I like about your Facebook group is people do that. They'll post a picture and say, this just didn't work. What did I do wrong? Or how can I do it differently? But I find that social media has become so perfect and so focused on how people view you and how many engagements, followers you can get from it that's just completely lost touch with the reality of 
what it's like to Absolutely. to grow your own food, to have your own animals, to look after land. Hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, guys, if you want to come join our community, we're about 56,000 strong. On Facebook, it's called Self-Sufficient Homesteading and Gardening. Come join us. We, we're there to help each other. It's a really safe space. We are a very encouraging group. Um, that loves to support each other. So join us. Um, also, I have a Facebook page, the Self Sufficient Homes with Tanya Milan. So go like and follow that if you like to. You'll find some information there too. So join the right crowds. <laughs> community. Yeah, community. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't just spoken about community. Yeah. What is your view on community? <laughs> well, um, yeah, I'm so glad we, <laughs> we actually got to it because there's, I mean, community is everything. Yes. I think. There's two big community initiatives that you've started, which is like seed swapping, and then also the um, that bank that you you trade off the barter bank, yes. the bartering. So you've started off these two things, and with the ways that we live now, there's two communities, and you need to get the two of them right. You have your digital community and your physical community. Digital is all about learning trying to get mistakes physical community is about support yeah um if you need something who's there to help you that is not sitting in a different country on a different platform and if you want to go down this route your community is going to be everything and part of what i looked for in these five years that i've been looking for property is what is the community like and it's tricky because you don't want to be so isolated that it's you in the middle of nowhere with no one around you. It can be the safest place on earth, but crime-wise, you'll be safe, but you'll be vulnerable in every other way. If something happens, you fall, you run out of water, whatever the case may be. You break a disc or slip a disc. Or like I did, and then you've got to try and hobble your way home. Your actual community is so important. And there, where Tamago Homestead is, it's a very, very small little community. One road in that goes through, one road out. Everyone knows everyone. If I need to use a tractor, I know this person has it, and I just need to pay for the diesel. So we work together, we barter, we trade, someone has a high crop turnaround that needs constant drip irrigation and then they say, I have leftover drip irrigation, might need to patch it up, but here you go. So then you can use it rather than having to continuously buy. And then also just having each other. Yeah. If you're having a bad day that you can say, like, I don't want to do this anymore. And then you have your community to say, like, it's okay, we're there for you, push through. Because that's what community is about, being real and being able to say, like, I just I can't do this anymore. Or, who needs help? I'm very inspirational at the moment. Um, but being there for each other, online and physical, is super important. So if, if someone is wanting to be, grow their own food, become self-sufficient, buy land, homestead, whatever you want to label it, make sure that part of what you're looking at is what the community is like. This whole thing of uh, it's taken my mind to self-sufficiency and then I think community and it's like a contrasting, the words contrast each other and in my mind you cannot be self-sufficient without your community because yeah. you really need those around you and this is what makes it so special. I mean your community, your physical community is great. I mean we had a fire the other day and the farmers just came and the fire was like 100 meters from a house so community physical community is so important and then you've got the digital community and i find there is so much value in both so we yeah. need to we need to keep our community close we need to um and that's by sewing into their lives and also you will reap at the end of the day because we all need each other to get to where we want to be I love what you said there because it comes back to what I said of anything to do with an est yes. is I don't listen to. Yes. Because once again, you'd have your purists who say self-sufficiency self is no external inputs. You do everything yourself. And if you can't do it yourself, you can't call yourself self-sufficient. Yeah. So that's a purist, which in my mind, 
I don't pay attention to because like you said, if you don't have something, use your community. Yes. Like that does not alter or change your view on self sufficiency at all. It actually enhances it. Yeah. <laughs> and there's and then there's new terms that come out like community sufficiency, community self sufficiency and all of that. And I think we we often get so tangled up in labels that we we forget that ultimately what we're looking to do is all live the same way. Learn from each other. Learn from each other. Share experiences, share produce, share knowledge. And we're all working towards the same goal. Remove the labels. It'll help a lot. <laughs> Absolutely. And this is what's making it so cool, this road trip that I'm doing. And the fact that I'm, for instance, meeting you and all these other people that's in our community, in our digital community. And um, the amount of things I've learned from you is insane. I mean, just this morning I was learning about the peach leaf curl. Peach leaf curl. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw it with somebody else that asked me advice. I said, I don't know. But I'll find out for you. And here I am with Craig today, two days later, and I can answer the question. So that is so crucial that we can yeah. lean on each other and help each other. And 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 this whole thing of supporting each other, slingshot. You know, I've had some talks where you take somebody from down, you sling them to the top. They'll come back. They'll pick you up and they'll sling you to the top. Being like stepping stones for other people um, and just being there for each other and sharing and not just trying to keep everything for ourselves because we don't know everything ourselves either so let's just be there for each other help each other and grow our dream and our community yeah. so but Craig it's been absolutely fabulous speaking to you thank you for all your insights and your knowledge and for, for sharing your dream I mean this is just amazing to see something from start I mean the urban you're still in the city you're still working and you're trying to get to a place where you're in the mountains and just connecting with nature and your family and your community and everything so it's going to be an awesome journey so um we will put the link to to your your channels in, you. in the description so people can find you so just go check it out um you will want to follow this this is really good so thank you very much for for being with us today i really appreciate it thank you tanya for the opportunity it's like i said so awesome to get to meet you and talk i think in closing the, the two words I just want to leave with everyone that has watched towards the end is the two most important words we can live by is kindness and grace. Amen. If you can, in your life, just practice kindness and grace, everything you do will be different. Because grace is going to allow you to be tolerant of others and kindness is going to be allow you to treat people in a very different way. So if you... Try and take on kindness and grace in everything you do. Even if someone believes something completely different, you'll at least have a very, very positive, um, meaningful way of talking about it. So thank you very, very much. I really, really enjoyed this conversation. I really said I ending, I mean, I've ended off this conversation now because now there's a whole <laughs> new turn of worms been opened and I just love what you just said kindness and grace and that's what our community is also all about so uh, we're so glad you're part of our community and and contributing to that so thank you very much <laughs> thank you Tanya and yeah, to many many years of successful growing ahead amen to both of us well guys thank you for joining us we're really glad to you watch this video with us and spend some time with us if you appreciate this video give it a like send me some comments tell me what else you want to hear maybe other trailblazers you want me to interview and if you really like the content subscribe i would really appreciate your support okay guys you must have a fabulous day and i'll see you next time